So we are going to start this post-lunch session, not the post-truth session, but the post-lunch session, um, with a keynote by Dr. Naomi Hussain. We are very pleased to have her. Um, she's a research fellow at IDS, the Institute of Development Studies in Sussex, but she's flown in all the way from Washington, D.C., where she says the conversations are a bit different than the conversations she's been having here, in a positive way. Naomi is um, somebody who's really interested in the politics of poverty. Uh, she's interested in uh, global food crises, elite perceptions of poverty. Uh, she's written extensively on social protection. Um, she blogs on the LSE website. She, her degrees, her undergraduate and, and master's degrees are from Oxford and from um, LSE and she has a diffil from, from Sussex. So we're just so delighted to have her here, and she's coming up with a brand new book called The Aid Lab, something about success in Bangladesh and political settlements that she may be willing to talk to you about today. So welcome, Naomi. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much for inviting me. I am very pleased to be here, and it is as, am I speaking correctly into the microphone? You can hear me, I'm not too loud, I'm not too quiet. Good. Um, it is, as Dan said, uh, a very different conversation to the conversations I'm having and hearing around me in Washington, D.C., although there is only one topic of conversation right now in Washington, D.C., and that is w how you get tickets for Hamilton, of course, <laughs> you can imagine. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here, um, and I want to say thank you very much to Benedict and Dan for um, inviting me, and also to the organizers of the conference. I have never been to such a smoothly run uh, conference in my life. Everything is very clear, everything is well organized. It's congratulations to you all. Um, I'll be hiring you for, you know, in your next job, I hope. Um, I'm very pleased to be here to be talking about these issues in particular because um, uh, I'm just in the middle of writing a book with some colleagues um, at IDS and other places about these issues of the uh, global moral economy and the politics of social protection. So it's a chance for me to test out these ideas on a, on a knowledgeable audience, people who are talking about global governance issues all the time. Um, in this talk, I want to argue that uh, I want to argue that the politics of social protection in precarious globalizing times are ultimately informed and given power and force by moral economic ideas, and that these appear to have a broadly shared form all around the world. Um, I'm also going to argue that we have seen these moral economic ideas being articulated in a range of different kinds of unruly politics around the world, as people have responded to the global economic shock since 2008, the most recent one being two weeks ago in, in, in the US. And these global economic shocks have highlighted, and this is for me a very important part of the story, they have highlighted the ultimately careless nature of contemporary global economic governance. And drawing on the insights of feminist economics in particular, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about how these are economic um, practices and forms of governance that actively impinge upon or neglect processes of care that, on which the reproduction of society depends so centrally and on which the human well-being is really ultimately based. Um, then I want to say a couple of nice and hopefully positive and optimistic things um, about two uh, new, newish social movements. Actually, they're not very new, but they're coming up in new and interesting ways, um, which I think um, express um, in, in, in fresh ways this, this moral economic feeling. And these are um, the human right to food and the universal basic income. I also want to say a little bit about what I think the limitations of these two um, agendas are. And finally, and this is the bit where I'm most tentative, and this has very much um, uh, come out of the last couple of weeks, uh, sitting in Washington, D.C., thinking about what went wrong and what the elites didn't know. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about what I think of as a kind of drone tendency in development studies, um, a kind of technological, expertified trend in knowledge, which I think empowers researchers, disempowers the researched, and I think... Uh, has something to do with the backlash against um, experts and elites. So, before I start, or as I start, I should probably explain what I mean by... Oh, no, wait, before I talk about the moral economy, let me tell you where I get these ideas from. Um, I'm going to draw on two very large and very long um, and very difficult to manage projects that I've been involved with over the last five years. The first is a study of the food rights and the food riots 
um, in Bangladesh, India, Mozambique, and Kenya over the period 2007 to 2012. I mainly like to show this because I think it's such a great picture, um, but it's, a, it's been a very important and formative piece of work uh, for me and several of my colleagues, including people in the right to food movements in India and Kenya. Um, a second piece of work is a joint project with Oxfam that went on for what felt like 100 years, but in fact was only about four. Um, and this was a, a study of uh, how people were adjusting to the aftermath of the, of the global food crisis um, in low and middle income countries around the world. Um, and that's just finished and we are writing, writing this stuff up in books and so on. And the final thing is, uh, as Dan mentioned, and thank you very much for giving me a chance to plug my book, which is out in February, by the way, um, The Aid Lab, which is a study of what, what has gone right in Bangladesh and why. Um, and this is partly it's interesting because, um, for, for this presentation today, partly it's interesting because um, of how it puts subsistence crises at the very center of the politics of development. But also, it's very important to me um, that it says something very significant about the way we do development research and the way in which people in Bangladesh have been treated as the subjects of aid research um, and less, less rarely as agents of research. And I think there are some significant problems with that from a rights perspective. Um, and uh, I will talk a little bit about that towards the end, I hope. But let me talk a little bit first about what I mean by the moral economy. So within development studies, I think we're mainly familiar with the moral economy from James Scott's work. Um, the seminal study, The Moral Economy of the Southeast Asian Peasant, in which he defines the moral economy as a notion of economic justice and their working definition of exploitation, their view of which claims on their product were tolerable and which intolerable. The central economic and political transformations of the colonial era served to systematically violate the peasantry's vision of social equity. So a class of low-classness came to provide far more than the proletariat, the shock troops of rebellion and revolution. Because I tend to work uh, mainly on the, or in the last five or so years, on the global food crisis of 2007, 2012. I'm giving that quite a long, long time span, but that'll be clear later why that is. Um, and I'm also interested in the wave of food rights that engendered. I I'm, I'm, tend to be more interested in the way E.P. Thompson, the social historian of the English working class, has used the moral economy. And those of you who are interested in that term, you'll remember that uh, it was, in fact, E.P. Thompson who originated the term or popularized the term in his famous essay on the, on the English crowd. But he used the term the moral economy to apply to popular political culture, so views, beliefs, and practices of how food markets should work. So it's very much a normative thing. And this was founded on a specific model of the regulation of the marketing of food supplies that, that dated, to some degree, back to Tudor times. And he found the moral economy tended to be kind of it would lie dormant, people wouldn't talk about it, and then there would be a crisis, and suddenly you would hear all these ideas coming up. Um, and it used to be used by the poor to legitimize kind of collective action um, and with the, with the principle that food provisioning should always take precedence over the rights to profit uh, from private property and enterprise. So I like, I like all of this work. I find it all endlessly fascinating. I've been reading this stuff for many years. But the, both the Scott and the Thompson notions of the moral economy bring together a set of issues that I think really resonate in, in today's uh, contemporary popular politics um, in a number of ways. One is a focus on making a living or provisioning the work that's necessary to feed your family and reproduce society. An emphasis on transformative forms of economic change and how they bring up a need for new mechanisms of governance in particular in those moments of crisis during the transition. It also brings a focus on popular political responses, Thompson's The Crowd, a kind of formless mass direct action that is separate from, distinct from class consciousness or group organization. These popular responses are often rule breaking or norm breaking and they take elites by surprise. This is all sounding familiar, I think, now. Uh, it also focuses on principles of economic and political justice, which sometimes draw on ideas about custom, even if these things were not actually there in, 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 in tradition, a kind of invention of tradition idea. And finally, beliefs about the accountability of public authorities and what you have to do to make them listen, if you have to. And for Thompson, it was very important to take the, seriously the idea that people did not just protest because they were angry and hungry, but they had a political theory. So for me, the moral economy is a kind of political theory for food rioters. People don't just protest because they're hungry or angry or insecure. They have to have, there's two things that have to be there. One is the space and the opportunity. And the other is, they have to have the idea that their rights, in some sense, are being trampled upon unjustly. 
But how, how this political expression finds its form depends very much on the opportunities available. Have I forgotten to change my slides? I think I have. No, I haven't. Um, so where have we recently heard the idea that left unprotected against economic crises, the crowd may revolt in unexpected ways? Um, this, I think, since Brexit, we've been hearing a lot about this. It's had enormous force in the wake of Brexit and Trump. And the elites are shocked, and I think they should be. But I thought that Glenn Greenwald, and this is the same Glenn Greenwald who, who leaked the, uh, the NSA files to the, to the Guardian, I think he really summarized it very nicely, very forcefully. I won't read that, I'll let you read that. They, the elites, or we, perhaps, did not expect these, prom these responses. I'll talk a bit more about what the elite didn't know uh, later. But I think it's true to say that the popular political response to globalization has become a, if not the, hot issue in world politics. But actually, popular politics, popular protests have been rising ever since the global economic crisis. This is not Brexit and Trump are part of a, a much bigger uh, trend. I think we were talking earlier um, in the session previously about the, the, the struggles in, in Brazil, the World Cup riots. And of course, there was Taxon Square as well as, uh, as we know, the Occupy movement. There was the anti-austerity protests in Europe. I guess you didn't have them in Norway, but then maybe you didn't have austerity like we have in Britain. Um, I would also include in this the Arab uprisings, um, which it's now generally believed were triggered by food crisis, at least at the start. And of course, the food riots of 2007, 2012. These are mostly in developing countries that are exposed to global grain markets. These are all very, very different kinds of protests, but they have some common moral economy features, I think. Um, with colleagues at IDS and in Bangladesh, India, Kenya, and Mozambique, we studied these periods of food riots um, quite closely. We looked at the political events through the prism of the media. We talked to the participants in the struggles. We talked to the policymakers and their responses. And uh, we learned several things about uh, these struggles for the right to food. Um, each of them was related in some way to a subsistence crisis, but they took very, very different political shape, depending very much on the political opportunities that were there in the environment, the organizations that were, were protesting, that were struggling. Um, we found that the, the media, international and national media, played a very interesting role in amplifying, also in silencing some protests. Um, we learned that uh, in, in Bangladesh and in Mozambique, where there were supposed to have been food riots, there weren't really food riots, they were something else altogether. In India and in Kenya, where there were not supposed to have been food riots, there were food riots, and they looked very, very different to what the media said when you got close up. Um, India and Kenya both have a constitutional right to food, so we weren't expecting there to be people fighting in the streets over the right to food, but there they were. So one lesson we learned was that you need to be wary of the way the media frames political struggles. <laughs> Again, it's resonating, I think, with... I, I did write most of this speech before <laughs> the American election, but it, it feels like it, it keeps resonating with what we're hearing now. But I think you have to be wary about what the, what the media says. Reportage often says just as much about the preoccupations of the media as about the struggles themselves. But a second lesson is that even in globalized times, and this is a very important one, even in globalized times, people look to their governments. Whether they've elected them dem democratically or not, they look to their governments. They expect as citizens or as denizens, perhaps even, that they will get some protection, if from anywhere, from their government. So, and, and governments, in fact, respond, we found, uh, in, most, in most cases, that is, they feel that this is their, the, the base of their, of their legitimacy is, is at least the protection um, in times of crisis. And finally, although each of these struggles decanted itself into a very different political form, depending on what was available to people, each of the struggles had very similar motifs and was situated in far deeper and more enduring struggles to assert the superior morality of the right to subsistence, to a good life, against the right to profit from hunger. So, I want to talk a bit now about what I'm calling careless economies. What is it about life under globalization that some people sometimes dislike it so much that they are willing to risk everything to protest? It's not actually that obvious. Um, we know from Piketty, and more recently from, everyone's seen this, right? Branko Milanovic's famous elephant graph, which really explains Brexit and Trump, for some people anyway, in, in one. Uh, this shows you how the, the very poorest in the very poorest countries have not gained much income from globalization, and the, the masses of the lower middle and working classes of the rich countries have also not benefited 
uh, much from globalization in terms of income growth. But the rich in all countries, they've done pretty well. So that's the, that's the, the, the pressy of, uh, of the elephant graph. Um, but uh, I, think, uh, I don't think it's enough to just talk about income. Uh, I don't think, in fact, that it's income levels and income growth that matter so much um, as the ill-being and the insecurity or precarity that globalization, and particularly globalization-induced shocks, create in people who aren't rich enough to protect themselves. And I think there's a particularly important gendered dimension to this uh, change. And I think that one of the things the, that the Trump election has done is really drawn our eyes to a particular kind of masculinity, which we, now that we've seen it so clearly, it's very hard to, to not see it everywhere. Um, and I'm going to look at, I'm going to illustrate these points with reference to things that we've learned about how people have been adjusting to the higher and more volatile food price, prices after the peak of the global food crisis. Um, I just wanted to say that after 2012, Whenever I mentioned the global food crisis, everyone said, but that's, that's old news, that's finished, that's long gone. But actually, when you look at this graph, this shows you that in real terms, food prices remained high in most places. In nominal terms, they've remained very, very high until about 2015. And they have, they have uh, tailed off, as, as Professor Sundaram showed us this morning, after two, 2014, commodity prices really dropped and stayed low. Um, apart from probably the countries where uh, the El Nino effect um, had an impact on food, food prices last year and probably this year as well. But food prices did stabilize, but they were basically high for many, many years. Whenever I spoke to any economist friends, they would say to me, but you know, wages adjust. And it's true, wages do adjust, but it's not a magic, magic formula. It takes time, there is a lag, and people often have to struggle for their wages uh, to rise. And what we found when we studied, uh, we, we visited people the same groups of people for over four years, in some cases seven years, in 23 sites in 10 countries. And these are all people, I should say, who were already on low and precarious incomes before the global food crisis. So when prices went up by 50%, this was a very big deal for them. So we went and visited them and, and looked at how they were adjusting their livelihoods and their lives. Um, and people did say even when their wages went up at some point after the global food crisis, they didn't usually feel that they were better off. And I'll explain why this was. Um, they basically said that there was a, a squeeze on provisioning. Um, what we found was, was two things happened when prices went up, and this was quite common uh, everywhere. We took, a, we took an analytical sociology approach to this. It's very dull methodology stuff. I can talk to you about it if you like. Um, and there is a paper about that in one of the bulletins that I've left outside. Um, but essentially, we pared it down to two mechanisms that seemed to be in common across almost all of these places, among almost all of these people. The first was, uh, food prices went up, this created an immense pressure on people to earn higher cash incomes immediately, and by almost any means. Uh, this meant people took on more work, worked longer hours, they traveled further, migrated more, took on more dangerous or illegal work, took on more short-term work. This is all sounding a bit familiar, I think. This is, they became more like the precariat. They drew more family members into the workforce, did more demeaning work, took on more low-paid work, did more labor for work, I think Guy Standing calls it, which is basically traveling around, looking around for work, phoning up for work, you know, drawing on your networks to get work. So that was the, that was the first thing that they did. Um, now, many of, these, many of these processes of change in people's livelihoods were already in place, the de-agrarianization in some places, um, informalization in others. Most people have never been in the formal sector anyway, so this is just about a, an increase in the precariousness of the kinds of informal labor they were already doing. But we like to think of this as a, a process of the food price crisis accelerating trends towards a commodification of the relationship between people and subsistence. Um, and I've often thought of it as uh, Karl Polanyi's great transformation on steroids. It sped everything up really fast. The second intense pressure that people experienced that they told us about was that, and this was a surprise for us actually, was that they had to get more value in whatever they consumed. And surprisingly enough, this resulted in people saying that they were buying more, more food and eating more processed food than in the past. And we, we didn't expect this, but this is what we found. And this seems to be borne out by the wider, more quantitative literature 
um, on, on the nutritional transition and the changing food markets. But it had to do with the fact that people, in particular women, were working longer hours and having less time to shop, prepare and cook food, people traveling more and eating on the run, and the availability of more processed and cooked foods for sale, growing markets. So in Indonesia, um, where I was living at the time we were doing this work, you would see these Indomarts, these, these shops where you, sell, you hit by the most hideous processed food, popping up all over the country like a rash. And people would say, yes, yes, we've got a new Indomart, so now we, we, like to, uh, we like to buy our food there. We don't grind our own spices anymore. Well, people were actually people were quite ambivalent about most of these, both of these changes. They found it quite exciting and quite modern and quite dynamic, but also quite stressful. People worried about their cultural and social habits. They felt a real squeeze on their time, on their relationships, their own social connections. In general, there was a, a sense of loss of well-being. And it strikes me that our, our research findings spoke quite well to two of Nancy Fraser's recent important themes. One was um, a sense that, grow, that global capitalism grows in part through commodification and or neglect of the processes of social reproduction that, that, that well-being and human life depends on so centrally. I think this is well known and her recent essay on the crisis of care has documented this very well. But there is another aspect to this, and this is where the ambivalence comes in, and that is that global cap capitalism has also been very successful in, in absorbing and regurgitating, I should say, a particular kind of feminism, a particular kind of sense that low-paid work for women is, is very emancipatory, it's very empowering. And it is, to a certain extent. So both of these things are going on at the same time. It is quite ambivalent, it is exploitative, and it's also empowering at the same time. But this emancipation or empowerment has largely resulted from the inability of single, implicitly male wages to cover the costs of basic subsistence. There is a basic subsistence. There's a sense for many in which uh, gender relations have become a kind of poor man's patriarchy in the sense that there is a model of breadwinning or provisioning uh, as masculinity that most men on low incomes can never really fulfill. But however unevenly the work of care was and still is distributed, people experience the contemporary crisis of care as a loss. You know, they feel that they don't have enough time for their families. They don't live as well as they used to. They can't supervise their children properly. They can't feed their families as well as they used to. And of course, it also has impacts on poverty. So the costs of health care push people into poverty in developing countries, as we know. I now want to talk a little bit about um, the right to food and the universal basic income. I'm not planning to talk for very long because I'm hoping we can have a discussion about these issues, so I've only got a few more pages, a few more slides. Um, one of the more positive things that has emerged in the last few years, I should say, actually, I think we've, one thing we have learned not so positive is that all of the progress in the recent times is not irreversible. I think we know that. And um, when I was writing my book, um, The Aid Lab, about Bangladesh, which is mainly set in the 70s, I was, it, it struck me very forcefully that the, the old debates about lifeboat ethics... Anyone remember lifeboat ethics? Garrett Hardin? Yeah, there's some people nodding. A really, really um, hideous um, ethical theory or moral philosophy, um, which says, essentially, in the rich world, we can't afford to have all these people come, uh, all these migrants and these poor people coming to us. Um, we... We, they're not our problems, they'll have to deal with themselves. If they come to us, we won't be able to cope. I don't think you have this uh, kind of language in Norway, or certainly not as much as you have in, in uh, some of the other places I'm very familiar with. Um, but, um, you know, this, this refusal to accept even a share of the responsibilities um, for the problems of the rest of the world. Um, but I think that if we, if we start to, to talk about or think about the common moral economy ideas that we, we seem to possess. I think it helps us move towards recognizing our common concerns. Um, and in those spaces, I think we can begin to articulate a more meaningful politics of social protection in what is now and is going to be in the future a very highly precarious e era. But so these two movements, these uh, universal basic income and uh, the right to food movement are quite universalist in their aims. And I think they both um, make me feel optimistic. Uh, both do more than, I mean, contemporary social protection and development has become a matter of very tightly targeting a very stingy amount of resources to the very, very poor, poorest people to ensure they do not die and nothing more. There's no safety net for the wider population. There's no sense in which uh, the social aspects of, of society, of human organization need to be protected. Uh, those parts of life 
that actually the market can never really um, uh, govern properly. Uh, those things need to be protected by social protection, but this is not there in contemporary development discourse of social protection. But these two movements are introducing these elements in different ways. So the global right to food movement, I think many people here know uh, a lot about this, probably, in fact, more than I do, but it's very much in the human rights tradition, and it's, it provides, I think, what's a useful consumer counterpoint to another very important struggle, which is the food sovereignty movement, which is very much located in peasant struggles. But the right to food movement is all about establishing legal recognition for, for the right to food in however that gets articulated, ratifying it, and then operationalizing it in some way. And that's where it gets really tricky. Um, so in some, in some countries like India, as we know, the right has gone all the way through to operationalization and even to backlash uh, from the incoming government, uh, the Modi government, um, in a context where both chronic and acute hunger remain quite serious concerns. But in, in Kenya, by contrast, there is a constitutional right, but uh, in fact, uh, it has remained very much an aspiration. There's, there's, there's very li limited evidence of um, realization of the right to food. Uh, it's interesting, we noticed, I think it was last week, that Scotland is planning to introduce a right to food, right to food legislation. And I think it's, you know, it's really rather depressing in, in, in Britain where uh, reliance on food banks has become a very, very significant problem. One of the richest countries in the world, um, about a million people a year, um, are now going to charities, essentially, to get basic food stuff. So I think it's, 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 it's a sign that we need a right to food, even in these countries. So the right to food movement really does strike me as responding very well to some of the moral economic concerns about the careless nature of globalizing economies. Uh, we did a study, colleagues of mine and I did a study, um, where we talked to people in, in the countries that we're working in, these 10 countries, about what the right to food meant to them. And we learned, and this was very interesting to me, we learned that there was a kind of a common sense approach to the right to food. Most people hadn't heard of the human right to food they had in Kenya, uh, they had in Bolivia, there's no surprise there, but in many other places they had not heard of the right to food and they, didn't, they weren't sure if such a thing was ever feasible. But when we talked with people about the way they thought about the accountability of their state when it came to hunger or how they go about ensuring their own food security when they were faced with hunger, we found that there was, there was often an almost natural right to food in the way they spoke about um, hunger and subsistence. Um, and this, right to, this natural right to food was based on the fact that if you cannot eat well, you cannot work well, you cannot look after your family, you can't live. So to be a productive member of society, you have to be able to eat. Um, also, I think everyone thought that you should be able to support it, you should be able to eat well, particularly in times of the life cycle when you're most vulnerable. Um, and eating well is more than just basic physiological needs. And I think this is very much a rebuke to the nutritionist agenda. It's about good food being about culture and tradition and, and taste rather than just about micronutrients and calories and so on. Um, and in the final resort, when major crises strike, the state is responsible for protecting people's rights to food. Again, it, it comes down to national governments, really. And what we think when we think about what, these, what this common sense approach to the right to food tells us is that actually the right to food movement has a rich resource of, of religious beliefs, cultural beliefs, social practices, charitable practices on which to draw, as well as in some countries a historical memory of famine. And they can build on this. But at present, there's a big gap, I think, between legalistic notions of the right to food and how people really understand it. The other movement of great interest to me is the Campaign for Basic Income Grants, or Universal, universal Basic Incomes. And these, I think, you've probably come across them in various places. I think Switzerland had a referendum on this last year, which lost rather badly, but still had a good discussion about it. Um, and the, the idea is that you'd have an unconditional cash payment to every, every adult citizen in the society, and this would you know, replace all other welfare, and they could do whatever they want with it, and uh, it would be costed, and it's, it has been costed in most, in most uh, places where it's been costed. The argument is that it would be much more expensive than what we have now, and in, it, would, it would crowd in all sorts of good things like... Uh, uh, better care in the, in the family, better, more volunteers, more creative work, and so on. And this is a promising approach, oh, promising approach to welfare in rich countries. 
But it's also getting attention in relation to development. There has been this idea that David Hume and Joe Hanlon have been saying for some years, just give money to poor people, you know, rather than all this conditionality and targeting and so on, just give them the money. Um, so it's had attention in development as well. And the key ideas are that people should all have the right to basic standards of living, states can and should protect those standards. Income transfers can achieve that basic protection. And, and this is very important, that technological change will soon mean that there's not enough work for everyone to be able to earn a decent living anyway. And this is a, an argument that's about 400 years old. And still, you know, still somehow we all have to work for a living. Um, but this idea that robots are taking over everything um, seems to be particularly prominent right now. Um, I think that there's, some, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, informal sector workers movements and a lot of academics like uh, Guy Standing, whose work I have a lot of time for, people who really understand the downsides of globalization, they are very strong proponents of the basic income grants. Other than fiscal burden and moral hazard, which are both arguments that come from the right, there are not many strong arguments against it. Um, but I, and I, think, I think it's all very exciting um, and promising. But there are a couple of caveats that I think are, are interesting for us to think about and talk about. The first is that I think people would have to give up any ideas, principles of self-reliance and dependence on their own labor and enter into quite different relationships with the state than that they currently have. And in our work, one of the things that we found with, with food price volatility was that people are very, very anxious about the fact that their honest labor is delinked from the ability to, to earn a decent living. This really makes them anxious. They could work all day and all night and still not be able to afford a decent living. They like to have control over the means of subsistence. This is a, in a key insight from the food sovereignty movement, is control over the means of subsistence. A second concern is that if we have learned anything in the century or so of welfare states is that you cannot take these for granted. Uh, the case, the political case for welfare states has to be constantly refreshed, constantly renewed um, as, as conditions change, as populations age, as immigration changes the composition of the population and so on. Um, can states in that situation really be relied on to provide basic incomes? I, I, I feel not. I mean, maybe even, even less so than markets can be relied on um, to assure a decent living. But the third issue, and I think this is a really key concern, is that this puts cash incomes at the center of human well-being. Um, unwittingly, perhaps, this idea commodifies and individualizes human well-being. It is possible that people will use their individual cash grants for the collective good, that they will build organizations, they will help each other, they will, I don't know. Um, but the protection of the social, as I understand social protection, should go beyond enabling people to pay for the goods and services um, they need. It means protecting them against the predations of the market. I think a great example is uh, traditional food cultures and cuisines, which we've seen in many places, just get wiped out very, very quickly uh, as people start moving into eating fried chicken or burgers or um, whatever, whatever it is. Um, so I don't see that basic income protections will necessarily stop the marketization of the world's food system. It might actually make it worse. I'm just going to finish with a few thoughts on what I'm calling drone development studies. Now, this is stuff that I've been thinking about for a while. Um, in relation to um, the treatment of the Bangladeshi population by uh, aid research. Um, but it also, it, I've also been thinking about this in relation to why the elites did not understand that globalization was um, making so many people so unhappy in the rich world that they were surprised by uh, Donald Trump's victory or by the Brexit vote. Um, and I'm talking, I think, when I say talk about drone development studies, there's a tendency, I think, in, in research to, for most of the space for legitimate evidence, for real evidence to be taken up by randomized control trials. I suspect maybe you're not that guilty in, the, in your, in your uh, area of, of the world um, of this, but certainly from my position in Washington, D.C., and when I'm in London, I feel this very much. The space for evidence, the space for knowledge is, is occupied more and more by randomized control trials, systematic reviews, both of which have very good reasons, of very, very good evidence in their own place, but they have come to be, they have come to constitute all of knowledge uh, for some policy thinking. Um, 
I, one, one example um, is that there was a move at some point towards more community-based targeting for social protection systems, and that's now gone. It's all about computerized databases um, in which elites can sit and policymakers can sit in the capital city in an, in an ice air-conditioned room with a tablet or something and target their social protection schemes from afar, and they have a sense of great accuracy and so on. Now, I'm not, I'm not one of these people who lives and dies for participatory research. I'm not an ethnographer who spent 18 months or two years in, in a village and therefore thinks that's the only knowledge. I think all kinds of knowledge, lots of different kinds of knowledge anyway, are good. In a post-truth world, I think we have to be careful, but I believe in a more democratic approach to knowledge. But the problem I find with this drone type of development studies is that it involves a very big distance between the researcher and the researched. And it's a social distance, an economic distance. It's an emotional distance. It's a physical distance, too. It tends to, I think, empower the researcher. It gives the researcher a sense of control. They talk about dashboards and interventions. I'll just do this, and I'll just... That's what's going to work. That's going to make everyone less poor. The sense of almost godlike capacity to change the world, I think, is, is unhelpful. And, but it also removes from those who are being researched the right of reply. They don't have any say in what gets researched and how it gets researched. I think it also confuses scale with accuracy and technical beauty with intelligence and truth. And uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't been thinking about these issues for very long, uh, but I, I begin to think that there is a so, an important sociological dimension to why we have started to look at the developing world in this way, why we have started to study globalization in this way. Oh, this was, a, this was an example. There was recently, you might have seen this on the, the CG, the Center for Global Development blogs, there was a discussion about the, 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 the technical accuracy of measuring poverty from space, I kid you not. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's very good, but just instantly I felt, it was, I felt it was wrong. I can't tell you why I felt it was wrong. Um, but uh, it really is, I, you know, I think about the people who are doing this research and why they are so distanced from the realities of globalization. And they are, the truth is, they're people very like me. They are very globalized people. They are mixed race people with many passports who move around the world, who have no real ties, for whom globalism is a great thing. We all do very, very well out of it. And it's like the old, the old joke that it's very hard to convince a man of something if his income depends on him believing the opposite. This is very true for us who should be studying the downsides of globalization, but who basically benefit so much from it that we find it hard. And I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you very much, Naomi. We have actually a generous amount of time for questions and comments from the floor, almost 20 minutes. Um, do I see a show of hands? Um, yes, Professor Tonquist. Can I also say thank you to you all for not falling asleep in the post-lunch hour? When I saw the spot I had, I was a bit worried about that. So far, so good. <laughs> uh, I, I, I like to ask a few questions about this basic income matter that you, that you brought up. Uh, three very you know, simple questions, but probably difficult anyway. But to me, they are puzzles. First, what's in it for the middle class and for those who are employed? Uh, you know, industrial worker with some decent income and so on. What's in it for them? Uh, and if it's not so much in it for them, how can you get a political majority for the proposal? That's the first question. The second is, what's in it for, for the employers? Uh, at least the, the, the uh, shall we say, progressive in the sense of modernization uh, oriented employers who can, you know, take us further on, sustainable growth and everything. And third, what is the transformative uh, effect of it? I mean, in the old welfare state programs, uh, programs there were and if, you know, we could take political decisions to support women, we could take decisions to, to, to provide work and unemployment for certain insurances and all that. What is, and that was transformative in many ways. Now, what's in it in the basic income? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily against it, I'm just skeptical. Thank you. 
Um, I don't see many other hands here, so Should why I don't start? you just? Yes, why don't you? Start? Yeah, I mean, I, I talked about this. I'm not, I'm not one of these people who, who is very involved in the movement or anything like that. And I told you, I told you why. Essentially, I have some concerns about it. But I think it creates a really interesting space for discussing exactly the sorts of things you're, you're raising. Um, I, I suspect that because the, the, the basic income grant is universal. What's in it for the middle classes and, and the employed people? Well, if I think about the country that I currently live in, in the United States, people work, people who are lucky enough to have jobs, and pretty much everyone has to work, uh, they work very long hours, they have no holidays pretty much to speak of. I mean, today they're all on holidays, Thanksgiving, but that's like the one day in the year um, where everyone's off. Uh, so I think there is, there are, there are populations, there are places where a basic income grant would release the, the necessity to work so incredibly bloody hard that you really have no other life. I think in particular the, the double or triple burden that, that many women feel they have, given that the burden of care work has not been shifted substantially to the state or to men or to other groups in, in most places. Uh, for many women who are in particular are mothers or carers of elderly parents, that would be a great thing. Um, what's in it for employers? I can see nothing at all in it for employers. So I don't see where your cross-class coalition in support of this would come from. Um, what is the transformative effect? There I think, um, I think it creates space, it creates in theory space for civic engagement that maybe, as I say, people who are so rushed off their feet they can't attend a political party meeting or even a school board meeting might have more space for it. All of this stuff has been, I think, very nicely addressed. There is a great website, um, Basic Income Earth Network, and a lot of this stuff has been uh, discussed. They're doing a lot of pilots around the world as well. I always get a bit nervous when people start talking about pilots. It sounds like more dr drone development studies to me. But these are, you know, really politically engaged, working with, um, you know, inform informal sector workers, groups and so on, to see what it would be like should you do it, how, how people would behave. Uh, most of the findings seem to suggest that people don't work very much less. They just have a little bit more of a cushion when times are hard. Okay, the gentleman here. Let's use her. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm Simon Maxwell. I love that presentation, and it links in so many ways to the one I'm going to give tomorrow, but with slightly different conclusions, I guess. And I do just want to say that when I was in Bangladesh earlier this year, which may be a great success story, they wouldn't let me out on my own without a bodyguard. And that's how much DACA may have changed for white people since uh, the 1970s. Um, the reason why I missed the beginning of the conference is because I was working in Os and also with Sum in Oslo on a food manifesto for Norway. Uh, and I'm mentioning it because it'd be great to have participation from people here in trying to get students and others to think about what are the implications of the kind of analysis you gave. So I'm struggling to see actually where you fit in the different narratives about food. You know, are, yes, are you a kind of food sovereignty person who thinks we should protect small farmers at all costs, use only local markets, develop community food systems, or are you at the other end, I think you're not the kind of neoliberal comparative advantage, or are you somewhere in the middle? And I'd like to hear a bit more about what, whether you think the food system is responsible for the alienation associated with globalization, or whether you think it's part of the solution, and what kind of food policy emerges from the analysis you've given us? I can go with that. I mean, I use the word commodification. I think you know where I stand on this. I think the food system is in deep trouble worldwide, but there's such a very strong worldwide, strong and varied worldwide uh, movement against uh, the industrialization of food, the financialization of food, and so on, that, that it is, I think it's really quite exciting time to be working on, on the politics of food. Worldwide, it's, 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 it's astounding once you get into it. Um, but it is, there is a tendency for, um, you know, for instance, the slow food movement and the food justice movements in the US to go a bit crazy. And the, the, the emphasis on localism and food miles and so on can also be quite counterproductive and, and highly elitist in some ways. There is, a, there is a happier balance to be found somewhere. Um, and I think the food sovereignty movement has a lot of good answers to those questions. It's not just about protecting small farmers. It is about it is about a, a kind of a political, um, a more political approach to, to control, which which recognises that 
Uh, many people are producers of food. Many people are also preparers, cooks. We all, you know, most of us cook. Again, I live in the U.S., and that's actually not true there. But most of us, you know, cook meals at home and so on. So we all we all work with food in our daily lives in, in a substantial way. So we all have a stake in this, and I think everyone should have more of a say in it. But the right to food movement, I think, is particularly um, important, despite its limitations as a very legalistic and human rights based uh, movement because it focuses on more on the consumer uh, than on the producer, which the food sovereignty movement does. Um, for me, the really big concern has been the last few years how to protect people against the kinds of volatilities in the, in, in the prices of staples that essentially really undermine all your efforts to do anything about nutrition and poverty reduction and so on. Because if people who are spending 50% of their income on rice or, or maize meal suddenly have to spend 85% of their um, income, that's, they're not going to be eating any beans or any vegetables. You can say goodbye to any of your uh, micronutrients. You can probably say goodbye to lots of other good things that might have happened. Uh, so it's, it's a really fundamental thing, I think, protecting people's ability to access the basic staples. Um, and one of the things that's happened in the world food system that I think we're noticing in a very local level, um, and which the, the, the big global statistics are also bearing out, is, is a clear industrialization a modernization of the, of, the, of the staples that people eat. We found in Ethiopia that people were saying that they weren't eating so much teff, you know, the, the wheat that they make in Nigeria. It's very expensive, only the elites eat it. In fact, I found it in my local Whole Foods store, you can buy teff, but in, but in Ethiopia people can't afford it so much. They're eating a lot more maize meal, a lot more um, rice, and this is true in many of the African countries. It's a real homogenization into basically rice, maize, and wheat. Um, where a, more a greater variety used to exist. And this, of course, is dangerous for other reasons as well. So let's take, a, about this stuff okay, let's take a couple of more questions. Hans Motten and then Aina. Here, first, here. Thank you. Uh, it's quite rare to be on, two, on a conference where two presentations are on the right, on the right to food. Uh, um, uh, I did my PhD on the right to food and I've also written about the right to food and food serenity. Uh, you said something... Where, where was your PhD on? Uh, the, right, the right to food and the TRIPS agreement, ah. uh, patent rights and human rights. Um, my question was about you talking about the gap between the legalistic approach and the more popular approaches. Uh, you didn't explain that very in detail. Uh, I want to say how I understand it. Um, because human rights is about holding to account uh, states and those that the state are responsible for controlling in some way <laughs> the, the corporations uh, based on standards which the states themselves have agreed upon by negotiations and then adopting the treaties and then ratifying them and then even incorporating them in legislation nationally. So there's a lot of processes in this. So by having a right to food approach you have kind of accountability based on given standards Right to uh, food serenity is a very elusive concept. Nobody knows what it is. So you have to start, start the process, kind of de defining it, which will take decades. Uh, so, uh, so I think that you, know, you have this accountability on the state with regard to standards which the state itself has agreed upon. So I don't really understand the gap. Can you explain more? Thank you. The gap, uh, as we understood it, was when we spoke to people about what the right to food meant, was how they understood it, um, as distinct from what the human rights uh, language of the right to food was. Um, and so it was very much an everyday kind of idea of what it meant to have a right to food in practice, more than a theoretical and aspirational right to food. On, on food sovereignty, I think part of the, this sounds a bit academic and not very helpful, but you know, the activists, the, you know, La Via Campesina and, and that lot, um, would say, I think, that part of the beauty of it is its elusiveness. You and I can't sit here and decide what it means because it's not, you know, we can decide what, our, what we want from our food sovereignty, but that's not for us to decide what they want in Peru or what they want in you know, Bali or wherever. And I think that's part of the point, is that it's up to people to, to, to make these rules and to develop these systems themselves in the face of the influx of really quite powerful agro-food industry um, interests. Um, and I think we had some discussion this morning with Professor Sundarams 
presentation about the, the scaling up nutrition lines. Actors like that who have quite a big impact, um, but not necessarily a great deal of downward accountability. Naomi, isn't it also the case that the right to food seems to have been somewhat hijacked by the courts, the, the legal arena? And some of the gap maybe that you're alluding to actually relates to the fact that politicians are pushing back and saying, why are you forcing me to implement a right that, we, you know, that I obviously don't have the resources to? And who elected you to this position? So civil society is actually using legal channels, and that is creating this tension between lawyers judges and politicians. Yeah, I think it's certainly in, in India that's a big part of the story there. I think it's, it's moving in different ways in different places. And I think, again, the point of rights is not that you get given it and then, and then you have it. It's about a struggle. It's a perpetual struggle in some ways. And I think having these struggles is a way of getting these debates out there and getting, getting them onto, for instance, political party manifestos. It's one of the things we're seeing. Mm -hmm in Bangladesh, for instance, where we would never have a human right to food. But the, the major parties take these issues into their policy agendas, into their mandate in different ways, because they know it's what people want. They know it's what they should be doing. Einar. Um. Einar Brot, <coughs> Norwegian Institute for Urban and Regional Research. <coughs> Thank you for a very interesting speech. I found uh, uh, the graph you showed about uh, world protests 2006 to 13, uh, very, very interesting. Uh, but I wonder, isn't that an uh, example of measuring something from space? <laughs> uh, how do you, uh, how can you really, uh, I mean, we all know that people have a lot of mixed reasons for, uh, for uh, going into the streets and so on, and then there's maybe one thing, which is the drop uh, so, um, uh, how, how, I'm just uh, curious about that, and also uh, food rights. Uh, how do you, how would you uh, define that? Is it when it's hunger, or is it when uh, the government ends uh, food subsidies? A lot of middle class and so on go to the streets then. Uh, price hikes of uh, uh, quality transport or on uh, on fuel which also will, uh, will uh, make food uh, more expensive and so on. So how, just to take that issue, how can you, uh, how can you aggregate that into uh, uh, this type of uh, food protests? Okay. Could you also explain what's on the political access? Oh, yes, sorry. I, I, I stole this from Ortiz, uh, Elizabeth, Isabel Ortiz and uh, colleagues who did a paper. In fact, they're reproducing these uh, graphs for the book that we're working on this. Yes, I mean, you got me on this. In fact, I had a much worse one, <laughs> which was a, 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 li a, a kind of a, what do you call it, a time lapse graph showing uh, uh, the increase in the number of protests since 1979, which I got from the GDELT uh, website. If, if any of you study political events, use political events catalogs, event counts, you really should have some fun on the GDELT um, website. It's a Google. It's a Google um, uh, exercise, and it really is a case of measuring poverty from space, except it's measuring uh, political unrest from space. And there's all kinds of ethical issues with that, which I had a discussion with the founder on, and they have no satisfactory answers about. But it's, it's a data set that's out there in the world, and you can see it, and you see the world map starts with these little scattering of, of print pics of light, and suddenly, by, by 2008, the whole world is lit up with protests. They're all based on media reports, essentially. The same is true of this one. This is made of, this is the number of media reports, uh, sorry, the number of events, rather, that were reported, not the number of media reports, the number of major um, protest events around different issues. The reason I like this piece of work is that uh, this group, and Isabel at that time, I think, was at UNICEF, um, this group, uh, were trying to make sense of what was going on in this very interesting period after the, after the uh, global economic crisis, during the global economic crisis, I should say. What were people protesting? What were people asking for? So this is quite a thoughtful piece of work, and it responds um, very closely to the Charles Tilley and Sidney Tarot discussion about contentious politics, because it looks at not only what people did, what they said, it, it tries also to look at the responses and how, how the repertoires of, of the contentious politics and the, the practices change. So I, 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 this is not the, this, the, 
the one that I had in there originally was the measuring poverty from space one, and I removed it, anticipating exactly that it was. This one I feel is a little bit better. But I, as I say, I'm very, very wary of these sorts of um, event catalogues because they are based on media reports. And I have seen in my own work, we looked at eight um, types of protests and looked at the media coverage, and the media coverage was so far from the reality. Um, I just don't feel they're reliable in any kind of detailed sense. They give you a kind of picture of the number. Well, uh, particularly if you look at the Chinese media coverage, every year there are like 80,000 protests. I don't think that is captured exactly. here. 80, I know, exactly. It's crazy numbers. Um, uh, on this issue of what is a, what is a right, what is a food right, um, uh, in, in the, for, for the pieces of work that uh, I have done on this, I, I haven't gone and defined that. And it, it, it varies enormously around the world. And I think there are several people in this room who are probably better positioned to give you a sense of the... Of the, of the um, of the variety of different meanings that people have applied to uh, the right to food in different ways. Um, I, for me, the, the base is that people have the right to be protected against, um, against shocks that, that will make them hungry. Um, I think that's absolutely the bare minimum. But I, but I think that if we look at what food security means uh, under um, the FAO de definition, the UN system definition, it has a, it's, a, it's a much more substantial meaning. Food security ha implies a certain number of, of rights in relation to the quality of food, in relation to the affordability of food, and so on. It's all implicit in the, in the concept of food security, and therefore it's all implicit in the, for, for instance, the sustainable development goals. So uh, we just have a couple of more minutes, and, I, and no more questions from here, from the floor. I wonder if you can elaborate a bit more on drone development. Now, uh, I love drones. They give the you know, bird's eye view. Uh, you know, it makes you see, see things from a totally different perspective. And a lot of people say perspective matters. So I'm just thinking, you know, is there anything positive you can say about drone development? What is the future of development? Is it a mixture of drones and uh, on-ground uh, you know, movement? Uh, I think that would, that would be nice, wouldn't it? I, I, the thing I, the, it just occurred to me more and more, especially when, when this idea that you could measure poverty from space and that would be enough, um, that this, this distance was not only um, a problem empirically and theoretically, but it's a problem politically for the, kinds of, for the kinds of people who talk to the kinds of people who have power, for the advisors to Hillary Clinton and you know, uh, Jeremy Corbyn or the British Prime Minister or you know, any of these people. Who are the people advising these people? Well, they're the kind of people who do this kind of research and who don't really have a handle because they don't have to have a handle on the realities of, of de development and globalization. So for me, it's, it's a political more than an intellectual or an empirical issue. Um, and it says a lot, I think, about the way we look at the world if we're not willing to go and get our hands dirty. I'm not saying everyone has to go and be an anthropologist. That's not what I'm saying. But I think it's important to, to have a good sense of the places you work in and to be constantly challenged and to be constantly tested on this. Yeah, drones are quite fun. I don't know if you've ever flown one, they are quite fun. But I think, you know, we, we all know what the ethics of, of drone warfare are like, and I feel it's very similar, the ethics of drone development. Okay, on that note, thank you very much, Naomi Sen.